everyone, and welcome back to Joe's Metal Man Cave vlog. Today we're going to do a collection update, a small pile of black metal CDs to talk about, and uh, for the first time in quite a while, I'm going to drink a beer uh, on my little show here. So, uh, something completely new to me, and uh, maybe not new to you, but is this beer right here, which is the uh, Schneider Weiss Avantinas Weizen Doppelbach, Brock uh, of Germany, so... I uh, feel like there's going to be uh, favorable results here. I should have had a table ready to do this, but uh, yeah. I like how you can find some of these like imported uh, German beers or whatever else, you know. For uh, three or four dollars, this big bottle here was only uh, four dollars. And it's time. Oh, sure. I've heard part of this. I, was, I don't know, I was going to say, uh, you know, all the newer like breweries in the USA, you know, sometimes this stuff is like 15, 20 dollars for like a, a four pack or a six pack, and then you can find these old, just, you know, ancient brews, so to speak, that are like, you know, uh, probably really good, but really cheap, so, anyway. Yep, that uh, tastes like a, a Weizen Doppelbach ale to me, so that's uh, pretty good. I have plenty to drink here, so that's good also. Drinking cheaply and uh, bargain hunting for uh, black metal, that's my whole fucking life, I guess. <laughs> so. Anyway, anyway, to kick things off, we are going to talk about a French black metal band known as Gorgon and their debut album, The Lady Rides a Black Horse. Now, I had never heard of Gorgon until uh, maybe a month or so. Uh, Arcane Archivist had posted some photos and general information about the band, and I was just like, yeah, all right, I had never heard of that one. And, uh, I mean, I obviously uh, trust uh, everything that the Arcane Archivist is posting to be quality material, and this is certainly no exception here. So uh, what I have here is a reissue that comes from Todd Street Records back in 2010, but the original album was released back in 1995. And uh, Gorgon has this history of being not only one of the first French black metal bands, but the first French black metal band to release an album. Now... The cover for this reissue, and even the original, is a bit pe peculiar, and uh, the album title, The Lady Rides a Black Horse, really leaves a lot of questions. Um, who was the lady, and why is she riding a black horse? Yeah. So then you have this reissue here, which has a picture of the, full, uh, picture of the band, and you're thinking to yourself, Huh, were they fans of Dismember? Because Dismember did a photo remarkably like that back in 91 or 92 for their first album. So, uh, really kind of peculiar right from the get-go here with uh, the album cover art, but uh, um, the band over the years has had a lot of members in and out, but the main driving force is guitarist, vocalist Kristoff. And uh, this is a phenomenal album that I had not expected to be so good, and uh, I mean, other than, like I said before, Arcane Archivist posted, but I had never heard of it. Um, basically, the style on display here is very Bathory influenced, but I also can very much tell that there's the Norwegian black metal influence uh, kind of, you know, getting into this band's uh, head and their music here. Um, what I really like about Kristoff's vocals right from the get-go, too, is that he has a voice that's remarkably similar to, uh, Seder from Satyricon, and I mean, like, really comparable to like the voice he used on Dark Medieval Times. And this album came out just a year after Dark Medieval Times, so it's probably safe to say it's just a coincidence. I don't know, but it's really cool. Some of the riffs and even some of the like the keyboarded parts of this album kind of remind me of Dark Medieval Times too. And it might just be me. I don't know, but I I mean, it's fucking cool. But a lot of the rest, of course, too, are also very much in that kind of '80s Bathory style. So you can kind of some of the more rock and head bobbing riffs, and there's a little bit of Celtic Frost, uh, you know, going on here too, but uh, all in all, uh, a really cool album, very dark, very uh, grim, and uh, just, you know, I, I said this before, but it's super cool when you just come across a random old black metal album, and it's really good. So on this reissue, you get the original album, which was from 1995, then you get a couple bonus tracks that were recorded in 94, but never released, then you get the 1993-7 GP, which is called Immortal Horde, and all of it's really good. Uh, I've also listened to some of the albums that came after this, and that's really good, too. And the newish album, which they released, like, two or three years ago, uh, was okay, too. But, uh, definitely gonna hunt down more of this band's, uh, old discography, because I really like this a lot. And, uh, yeah. Definitely, definitely worth looking up if you've never heard of stuff and you like. Uh, I guess what, to my ears, sounds like a good fusion of, you know, early Bathory with just a 
hint of Norwegian black metal kind of sneaking into the mix. So that uh, picture there, there's the lady, and um, interestingly, not in the original artwork or any of the artwork is she ever writing a black horse, and the lyrics don't really give any insight to why the fuck she's riding this black horse anyway. So, I don't know, I guess. Um, my best guess is just, they probably had a, a, only a small grasp on the English language at the time and something got lost in translation. But uh, I think at the same time, too, it probably sort of held the album back from being, like, reaching a, me, a bigger audience because people were probably just like me, like, what, what does that even mean? Why? Who cares if she's riding a fucking black horse? <laughs> so, uh, anyway, really good, though. Definitely look this up, Gorgon. The Lady Rides a Black Horse. Cheers! Well then, uh, continuing on, we're gonna talk about a brand new 2022 release, and, uh, <laughs> it's kind of a funny thing to admit, but, uh, a few weeks ago, a friend messaged me, and he's like, what is your favorite album of 2022? And I thought there, and I was like, huh, if I even, like, bought a new 2022 release because I'm, you know, so obsessed with, uh, finding old records that I missed out on years ago and stuff like that, and I really sat there genuinely for a few minutes of just kind of staring at the text thinking, like, I don't think I bought, like, a single 2022 release this year. Until now! And this was, goes back about three weeks ago, and I bought the new Ancestor Moth and Daedric Chamber split CD. So Ancestor Moth and Daedric Chamber are two uh, American black metal bands. Uh, this particular split here being the first release for Ancestor Moth, while uh, Daedric Chamber has two falling albums and a couple other EPs uh, behind them. Full solo projects, of course. Um, for a couple years now, there's been a bit of a, I guess, sort of a raw black metal thing going on in the United States. I don't pay attention to sh anything that's new. Uh, certainly not anything that's new in the United States, but uh, I've heard some of these bands, and a few of them are cool, but they're, it's gotten to the point where like, there's so many fucking bands that it's just like, eh. I, I, I can't keep up with it, and I don't want to say it's a trend, but it kind of seems like it's a trend. Um, anyway, I don't know shit about Ancestor Moth or where this guy comes from, but the Daedric Chamber guy, and the reason why I wanted to check this out is because thematically it's a bit of a departure from normal black metal, lyrically. I know some people say, you know, for it to be real black metal, it has to have satanic lyrics or anti-Christian lyrics, but uh, in the case of Daedric Chamber, it has lyrics center, centered around the Elder Scrolls video games, uh, Skyrim, and so on and so forth, if you know them. And, uh, I can admit right now that I'm a pretty big nerd, and I mean, I don't play video games as much as I did back when I was a kid, but I really like Skyrim, so that was why I wanted to check this project out. And uh, I dig Daedric Chamber. It is, it's cool stuff, and Ancestor Moth, now that I've heard him as well, it's cool stuff, but basically what we have on display from both bands is very minimal, very raw black metal bats. And this can be said for a lot of these newer black metal bands that have been popping up in the United States. Musically and production-wise, they remind me a lot of, like, Emperor's Wrath of the Tyrant demo and the early Black Funeral stuff, uh, specifically the, the Empires of Blood album. Very, very raw, very cold, very minimal, and, you know, I, I talk about those older releases, I love, you know, the early Emperor stuff, the uh, early Black Funeral stuff is... Okay, it's yeah. I used to own it, but I sold it quite a few years ago. But uh, it seems like that's been like the main main influence for a lot of these bands. Maybe it's I mean I don't know if they're all drawn in or they're just like you know copying each other. Just for, I, I don't I don't know. I don't want to think that, but I don't know. I don't pay attention to shit, so I don't know. And also a lot of these bands seem to be younger dudes, all in like their mid twenties. And then like a friend kind of informed me that there's this whole big movement of like like younger dudes in like the death metal scene they're like just doing this like tribute to like older death metal stuff like Cannibal Corpse and Incantation that's, there's a big movement in that scene too of all younger dudes but I, I, I think that's just like the way of things like eventually younger people are going to make more black metal and stuff like that right? right? so anyway, anyway both bands offer up uh, raw black metal comparable to what I just said and there's also of course some minimal dungeon synth characteristics to be found too and uh at least Daedric Chamber guy, he also has a, <laughs> a Dungeon Synth project called Schnitz or something like that, which I haven't heard, but uh, yeah, um, I think a lot of this raw black metal scene and the Dungeon stuff has become very interconnected and very close to each other. Um, again, you know, I, I don't pay attention to this shit, it's all probably like Facebook and whatever else. 
Yeah, but uh, I, I dig this. I don't. I mean, I don't know if I'll necessarily need to uh, get more material from this band or I'll follow them closely. But I dig it for what it is, and yeah, man. So this split is extremely limited. Um, just 15 copies were made, but a, uh, a tape was also made, which I think was slightly bigger in, uh, in quantities, but not too much. And uh, but yeah, if this is connected to the DS scene, it definitely will disappear very quickly. So if you missed out on this, uh, it's more than likely sold out by now. But uh, yeah, if you're into really raw black metal, again, similar to Early Emperor, um, you know. Black Funeral, all that kind of stuff, we'll probably dig this. So, yeah, Ancestors Mall and Danger Chamber. All right, the next band we're going to talk about is very much a uh, love them or hate them kind of band. Uh, for me personally, this band, uh, it's only the stuff from the 90s that's really worth listening to, and it's just complete rubbish after that. But uh, personally, I don't consider this band to be a black metal band, but I, I don't really know what else to file them under, so... Uh, so much mystery. What are we going to talk about? What are we going to talk about Cradle Filth? And their first uh, EP, which is called Vampire, are Dark Fairy Tales in Palestine. So, I guess like a lot of people, uh, going back to the early days of getting into black metal, Cradle Filth was one of the first bands that came up and Legitimately, you can't consider Cradle Filth a black metal band. This riffs ain't there, but I think the atmosphere is there and that's what's important. Ultimately, this band influenced and got a lot of people to black on. That's what's important about Cradle of Filth when all is said and done. But if you had to be realistic about it, I mean, you'd probably have to call them just extreme gothic metal or something. I mean, the cool thing about Cradle of Filth, and again, love them or hate them, is that there is no one else that sounds like Cradle of Filth. Well, except for those guys. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Cradle of Filth, man. Uh, uh, I have good memories of this band. I really liked them back in the day, but by the time they got uh, to their Almidian, it seemed like they were just going in a much more uh, very very accessible direction. I don't want to say mainstream, but it, by that point, they were pretty fucking popular, man. Uh, but and I, back in the day, I had you know the first album. I actually, really put, put everything they released in the nineties. But the only album I really hung on to over the years was. Uh, I can't remember what it's called right now, the one that's all centered around Bath the Cruelty and the Beast. Yeah, Cruelty and the Beast the one, one I've kept over the years, and I always wanted to get this one back then day, but I never bought it, and I, I don't know why. So then kind of recently, I was just uh, buying something or another off of eBay, and then, or not eBay, a disc, but I was buying something off of disc, and if you're anything like me, if, you buy a, if you're looking for a single CD on disc, you're always going to look at the, all the stuff the user has for sale, and he had this for sale for uh, $10, and it's original pressing from a... Uh, I cough on his records, and I was like, well, fuck, man, that's got to be worth more than that, usually. So I was like, I'm going to pick it up, and I'm going to find on the CD. Um, Vampire, as far as I'm concerned, is the first really, really good Cradle of Filth uh, album. I know some people like The Principle of Evil Made Flesh, but it just seems like the album is kind of rushed, and they just didn't really think the whole album through exactly. I mean, uh, yeah, that's another one where... I mean, maybe, maybe I'll rebuy that one someday, if I can find it for cheap, but I, I don't know. It never really... Hit me that deeply, I guess. Uh, if I gotta be honest with you, I always thought this was like the best starting point for Cradle of Filth. Um, it also welcomed in a whole new lineup after the first album. Danny Filth, of course, has been the only mainstay in the band over all these years. But uh, it welcomed a new guitarist, Stewart, who uh, actually just a few months ago randomly passed away unexpectedly. And uh, I feel like it's the albums he did with Stewart as the lead guitarist that are truly their best, which be in this album, uh, Dusk and Her Embrace, uh, Cruelty and the Bees. Uh, Beast from the Cradle to Enslave EP was what he stuck around for, and that's, yeah, man, that's the best stuff they released, for sure. But this is a really good album. It, it uh, well, technically an EP. It's about 36, 37 minutes long, but, you know, call it whatever you want. They call it an EP, I guess. Uh, I, I, it, it, it shows, like, their early sound really kind of fleshed out, and they kind of really got it down what they wanted to do, and it's really good. I like this album more than I like Dusk and Her Embrace. But not quite as much as like Cruelty and the Beast. But the problem with Cruelty and the Beast is that the production is shitty. So, and this production, this is really good. So it's like, eh, it, it, it's kind of a toss up between the two. But, uh, hell yeah, man. I mean, I, I guess you guys have heard there's nothing really, you know, you know, either, again, you, know, you love it or hate it. And uh, I love, like, <laughs> the fucking picture of the naked women and stuff like that. Like, this poor woman, like, she probably posed for this photo for, like, fucking, like, 50 
pop British pounds or something now. She's got to live with this topless photo of herself for the rest of eternity. <laughs> Poor woman. Anyway, there's the rest of the artwork. Um, but yeah, man, super cool to get an old old, old school press into this. Uh, I always thought, you know, the, the cradle filled photos in the booklets are really cool too. I like the fact that like they don't have like typical, uh, you know, times that they play. They don't just play uh, uh, bass or whatever, or guitar, you know, they're uh, the funeral dirge or whatever. You know what I'm saying? Like, I guess, well, I guess most black metal bands do that, whatever. I'm just rambling here at this point. <laughs> But yeah, a cool record, um, you know, again, love them or hate them, I obviously, as I already stated, just love the early stuff, but, uh, yeah, man, pretty old film. Yeah, that's a good one, I gotta buy more of that. So, the next album we're gonna talk about here is pretty much the epitome of random, this is another case of, uh, buying a single CD from a guy on Discogs and just being like, oh, what else has he got for uh, sale? And seeing something cheap and interesting and being like, oh, what the fuck, right? I'm drunk and I'm buying shit on Discogs. What could go wrong? Uh, nothing wrong in this case, but we're going to talk about the uh, five-way split, which is called Scream of the Eastern Lands. Now, I've always been a big fan of Eastern European black metal. There's just a very distinctive sound, distinctive atmosphere and feeling that... Uh, you know, you don't get like from, you know, Scandinavian black metal or American black metal or South American black metal or whatever. It is a very similar feeling. I, I don't know what it is. I can't really articulate it. I've never been able to articulate it, but it's just something there. And it's just a very, uh, you know, similar feeling. Um, yeah, so basically this, not a compilation, a split features uh, two songs from each band. And the bands featured are Visat, which is a band from Poland. Dub Buck, which I've talked about before, is a black metal band from Ukraine. Then you have Inferno, who is from Czechia. And you have the Immortal Hammer, who is from Slovakia. Uh, Nigura Bunjit from Romania. And Verdelet, who is from Hungary. And uh, I'm going to go on a little sidebar here. Um, Czechia. When did Czechia stop being the Czech Republic? Like, wasn't always the Czech Republic? Or, like, when did that change? <laughs> anyway, um, uh, yeah, so, uh, very good compilation, sorry, split here, that features five really good bands. Um, when I got this, I only, uh, knew Dub Buck and the Nagora Bungeon, of course, those are the more, I guess, common ones, maybe, I don't know, at least they're coming for me. The rest were really unknown, and it definitely gives me fuel to check out these bands' main albums, which I can only assume are going to be pretty good, because this material on here is very good. Um, all the bands represented more or less offer up raw black metal, but they definitely have their own unique twist to it. It's not like Dark Throne or Burzum influence, no. Um, it, it, it's got that Eastern European sound, and it's just distinctively, uh, distinctively uh, Eastern European, and there's just no easy way to really put it into perspective, but uh, I, I, I dig it, I love it, man. Uh, um, to be totally honest, my main reason for buying this was I thought the Dub Buck songs were exclusive to it. Like I thought, and I, but I, after doing a little research, it doesn't seem like anything on this uh, split is exclusive. But uh, nevertheless, it, you know, it's a little bit of a teaser for what these bands are all about. And I'm really, uh, well, <laughs> when I have money again, I'm definitely gonna invest the investigate a little time and just kind of check them out. But like, well, talk 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 about Bisat to start out. They're you know, kind of typical raw Polish black metal. Um, doesn't immediately remind me of like some like Graveland or Behemoth, but still you kind of, that feel is there. Uh, Dub Buck from uh, Ukraine. Um, I've talked about these guys before, I really dig it. It's heavily synthesized, uh, sometimes speedy and raw. I mean, it's, it's really good. If you've, not, if you've not heard Dub Buck, like, heed my warning or whatever, go check it out. It's really good. Inferno, uh, they're really good too. Uh, it's great, man. Uh, Immortal Hammer, which you can hear playing right now in the background, is a little bit faster with a programmed drum. Um, really just vicious raw black metal. And here we're going into a Nagora Bunjit song. I mean, Nagora Bunjit is uh, you know one of the one of the oldest you know black metal bands, or maybe the first black metal band from Romania. Just really great stuff. Um, their stuff in the '90s is, is not to be missed. It's fantastic, and I really need to get my shit together and buy some more of that old Lingora Bunch and stuff, because all I have is a demo compilation, which I think is fantastic, but uh, definitely need to get some more of their albums from the, the 90s and I think until the early 2000s, they're okay too, but kind of somewhere around me, they got a little too folky or something, I, I, I don't know, but uh, yeah. 
Um, then you have Verdelep, who, uh, to my ear, sounds like it's kind of really influenced by, like, Double Yard and stuff like that. So, yeah. That very minimalist, uh, you know, raw black metal style, or whatever you want to call it. Yarn. So anyway, there's the front cover, uh, you know, it's the normal landscape in the mystical eastern lands. Uh, let's uh, take a look at the booklet here. Oops. I don't know why I'm always breaking these seeds. Why does this keep catching? Um, I don't know. So there's the you know, front cover, and you get a little bit of information about each band, of course, where the releases come from, and so on and so forth, the lineup. I mean, it's just, it was a cheap way just to kind of, you know, get an idea of what some other bands sound like and, you know, stuff like this. You know, you're not going to find on, like, Spotify or any of these other streaming networks, so that's why it's important. You know, I've always said this is important to always keep and make sure you're buying physical media because, uh, you know, people just assume, like, stuff like Spotify or whatever is always going to exist and whatever else, but that's not the case. I guarantee you someday Spotify will not exist, so... Keep buying physical media, keep checking on the ground black metal, and uh, if you have a little money to spare and you want, if you're a big fan of uh, Eastern European black metal, if you've never heard these bands, definitely come up because they're really, really good. So, yeah, Scream of the Eastern Man. Alright, one more for this black metal collection update, and we're going to talk about a classic Norwegian black metal album. And then um, the question here is Trilldom and their album Til et Anet. Um, Til et Anet was originally released in 1999. Uh, this being a reissue here, of course, but uh, Trilldom was an early project for Gal Krishnespedal, who, uh, of course, went on to bigger and better things with Gorgoroth, and then, you know, had some uh, legal issues and some other uh, interesting things, too, and is, you know, a very iconic, uh, a very uh, unique individual in the Norwegian black metal scene uh, artist, and, uh, yeah, seems like a really cool guy. Uh... But this first album, I, I, don't, I don't really know shit, but uh, it feels like Trelldon was a band that always sort of flew under the radar. Because, I mean, like, when he got on Gorgoroth, like, Gorgoroth kind of got more popular, even though, like, the Gorgoroth albums from, like, 2000 onward are not particularly good. So, uh, Trelldon, uh, musically, uh, and I, I don't know if it's just a coincidence or what, it kind of sounds similar to what, like, Gorgoroth was doing back in, like, the mid early 90s but uh what i really like about this album is that gall's vocals are absolutely immense on this album i mean like like to say like he sounds possessed is like an understatement like he is just it's really good and it's really diverse like i like it when black metal vocals really have like a lot of just you know, not just a typical snarly black metal rap. Like his, his vocals are all over the place, I and mean, sometimes they're just weird. And there's like some, some cleanly sung parts too. It's it's cool, and I, I really like it, man. I mean, it's it's what, it's what really holds the album together. I mean, honestly, if they had a much more standard black metal vocalist on this album, it wouldn't be as good. But you know, even so, like there's a lot of really good riffs, there's a lot of good uh, drum work and stuff like that. I mean. I don't know exactly how to classify it, I guess you call it raw black metal, but this doesn't sound like it's influenced by, like, you know, Dark Throne or whatever, that more typical Norwegian black metal style. No, this sounds like it's, you know, again, sounds like pretty comparable with Gorgoroth, so it's interesting that, uh, you know, Gaul would eventually end up in Gorgoroth some years later. But, uh, I, I really dig this. This is really cool stuff. I really hope that someday they reissue the first Trelldom album, because I've heard of heard that too, and that's really fucking good, man, and it needs to be reissued, because I'm not in the idea of paying, uh, I think the last time I checked this, Cogs, the first album was quoting for like $120 minimum, and that's fucking bullshit, so hopefully someone reissues it soon. But, uh, yeah, there's a lot of lot to be said about the Trail Down, though, um, Gall has said that, like, he has multiple albums worth of Trail Down material available, but I think it's been, like, I think, like, 14 years since the last Trail Down album, and... Yeah, so hopefully someday I get released, and hopefully, uh, but we'll see what happens. I think he's probably mostly, uh, you know, uh, focused on his artwork and his main project, his solo project, uh, Gal's Beard. So we'll see, we'll see what happens. But yeah, yeah, there's the uh, album cover. It's different from the original. I don't know why, but yeah. Um, hopefully, like, what's in the book? I can't remember. I haven't through in a while. So there's that. We have the lyrics, of course, and pictures of the band on the reverse side here. 
get the strength from getting drunk, and beer has a lot of alcohol in it, and one shot. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, yeah, if you've overlooked Trail Dom, then I don't want to say that I personally overlooked them. I've always uh, wanted to get all their albums in my hands. It's just uh, this, these two earlier ones, I think, were kind of hard to get for a while. So kudos to Hammerheart Records for re-releasing them. And, oh, yeah, man, it's just a great album. Definitely look it up. Feel that in it. And I wanted to conclude this collection update just to uh, kind of tell you about a recent live experience um, me and my wife saw. So a couple weeks ago, me and my wife went down to Chicago, Illinois to uh, see Wardruna, which is the band of my shirt, in case you uh, didn't immediately recognize it. Um, me and my wife originally bought tickets for this show back in, uh, I want to say like mid-2019. <clears throat> And the show was originally supposed to happen in October of 2020, but of course, because of COVID bullshit, um, didn't happen. And then 2021 came along, and they still couldn't travel. They still couldn't play live. But uh, finally, um, I want to say it was October, <coughs> October 19th that we saw them live. Finally, in Chicago, Illinois. Um, so yeah, basically like three years in the making, and. It would have been a lot more special if had we seen them back in 2020 because me and my wife got married back on October 31st, of 2020. And it would have really been great to see them live like a week before we got married, but um, yeah, COVID fucked everything up, and including our wedding too. But uh, it was quite an amazing experience. And I suppose if you're European and you've maybe seen them, they've definitely toured there a lot more, but uh, what an amazing experience it was. Uh, yeah, man, I mean, uh, it was in a kind of an old theater in Chicago. Uh, the, the, the troubling thing was, was driving there, and I mean, if you've ever driven through Chicago, especially if you get caught in rush hour, is one of the most uh, anxiety-charged experiences. And I, I know there's worse traffic in America. You can go to New York or Los Angeles, or it's gonna be fucking worse, and I can't imagine, but I get really bad anxiety when I'm in Chicago traffic. Um, so that, that happened before the show, so it kind of put me in a bad mood, but then me and my wife got some food, we got some drinks, and it, it was better, you know? But uh, yeah, when the show started, it was really, really amazing. Um, you know, they had like sort of a projection screen behind them, and you could see like images of the band as they performed, and like, man, like, you know, you talk about a band like being like rehearsed and just like on the spot, man, like, man, were they ever amazing. Like, they didn't, I mean, there wasn't like a single thing that sounded like they fucked up, and I mean, I know they're realms fairly well so I was just like man it was just uh, but it was quite an ex you know it was quite an experience um both just musically and spiritually to a point I mean I'm not really like a religious person I guess you could say but uh, I definitely uh, I draw a lot of personal inspiration from like the natural world and I know that's where uh, where Juno's music is fueled from a lot you know I mean I have like a lot of like pagan themed stuff in this room and I often wear like meal and stuff like that but I would never uh, I would never really like consider myself to be like a pagan in a very uh, strict or disciplined sense I just uh, I feel some sort of connection to that and it's about as close as I come to being uh, religious and uh, you know my wife said it best after the show she was like that was like that was almost like a religious experience, and it really was. It was, it was really intense at times, and it was really cool. And just the band was really spot on. So, uh, yeah, I just want to talk about that. And I guess technically, a uh, shirt is a collection update too. Anyway, right? So, uh, definitely, if Warjuna, you know, I don't know if the tour is still going on in the United States or not, but if you get a chance, definitely go see it. It's, uh, it's a hell of an experience. So, yeah. Um, other than that, though, um, you know, my usual in these videos, uh, thing I say, you know, thank you so much for checking out this video. If you got all the way to this point, uh, you know, thank you. I really appreciate that, and, uh, man, you know me. I'll be back again soon with another video, more collection updates, and I got some other stuff, uh, planned because I have to cut back on my spending because as I've said me and my wife are doing renovations in our house we're putting the bathroom in the upstairs of our house and all this is very expensive and that a lot of that is on my credit card now staring at me so I just have to be realistic and stop buying stuff it's it's gonna be hard but um, 
to the cool shit I'll talk about. So, cheers. Um, enjoy your beers and uh, let me know what you're drinking in the comments. Let me know what you've been listening to. If you like any of these albums, I'd be curious to hear your opinion, of course, good or bad. And uh, other than that, I'll see you next time on Joe's Metal Man Cave Vlog.